Hunter, I unfortunately I do not have a really good intro question for today's episode because it's kind of a well, it's kind of a weird one. We're talking about Pangea today. Okay. So I think instead I figured what I would do is I would ask maybe something that's a little related and maybe just see if you can, you know, give me some sort of answer. And that is what do you think that the Appalachian Mountains here in North America, mm -hmm. the Atlas Mountains over in Africa, Northern Africa, and the Scottish Highlands, obviously in Europe and Scotland specifically, all have in common. All right. So I'm trying to figure it out based on the topic of the day. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing they were either all connected or they're all about the same age or both. I mean, they're all about the same age. Okay. And at one point, as it turns out, those three mountain ranges were all part of a single mountain range okay. called the Central Pangean Mountains. Wow. And all it's right. it's it's one of it's one of my favorite fun facts after doing a little bit of research for this episode. I think I had heard this before as well and some people have made some there's a there's actually a an article in I think the Nature Journal that has pulled together a lot of the data sort of around this this concept the geologic data. And they create some really fun maps that sort of show uh, the the extent of this central Pangean mountain range as it relates to sort of what we know today. So it's like, this is the, you can sort of see the entire mountain range. And it's like, well, this is the, you know, Appalachian part. And this is the Scottish Highland part. And this is the Atlas mountain part. And then they also threw in a little outline of like where, you know, present day uh, West Virginia would have been at the oh, time. So you can sort of like geolocate yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that's an interesting thing to look at, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. So anyways, it's it's really cool. I, I, I really love seeing that. This is obviously, listeners, we're talking about Pangea today. We're going to be talking a lot about sort of continents and how sort of they broke apart and came together and sort of what came really before humans. Because this is, I, I mean, in a way, this is kind of like the start of geography. <laughs> right, right. If, if we're studying the spatial distribution of things, uh, we need things to be spatially distributed first, like the land, right? So that's what kind of exactly. what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So while everything we're talk talking about today is is really steeped in in almost like geologic history, it's almost okay. like you know we could rename this like geology as everything for for the day for the week <laughs> or podcast. Uh, there is evidence uh, out there to suggest that Pangaea was obviously a real entity, and at one point, all of the land masses that we all you know humans exist on today were at one point all kind of clumped together. And wow. yeah. that makes, it, it kind of tells like an interesting sort of story of like, you know, about our planet and how, how things worked out and how maybe they could have worked out differently had some things changed. So let's go ahead and jump to, I would say probably the very, very wild world of Pangea because it was definitely a different kind of place than we know today. <laughs> and we're going to talk later, I think, about how we know all this, right? Is that something you've got yes. on for us? Okay, yes. Good. Yeah, we'll get to that in a, okay. in a minute here. Actually, before we get to the episode, I did have one really quick call out to a, a website called, bear with me, it's called dinosaurpictures.org slash ancient dash earth. We'll leave that inside the description for you all. But this this is a really cool website because what they've done they, is they have created a pretty detailed interactive map, sort of like a Google Earth kind of map that's like a sphere, a globe. And you can use that map to tr uh, track the changes as we describe them here in the video. So you can go back 750, I think 750 million years ago and sort of see what the Earth, in theory, looked like at that point. You can jump to the time of Pangaea, which was not 750 million years ago. It was actually more like 200 million years ago. You can sort of see what that looks like all the way up to today. Very cool map. Definitely one of my new favorite internet toys. You had me at dinosaur. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And of course, listener, if you are watching this on YouTube, of course, like these videos will be here. So as we're sort of talking through things, this map will probably be, you know, right here on your screen. Otherwise, we'll, we'll try and talk you through it as well. So with that, let's go ahead and jump to Pangaea. So Hunter, you had already sort of alluded to this. Today, we're going to talk about kind of two sets of histories, mm -hmm. right? There's the, there's going to be the, geologic history, how Pangaea formed, how it broke apart, you know, what was going on, all that kind of stuff. Then there's these other, there's this other his history, which is more of the human history, which is, well, how do we know that this was even a thing? How was it even possible for us, you know, sitting here, you know, in the year 2024 to know that 250 million years ago, there was this whole clumped land mass. Yeah. I'm pretty so, curious about this situation. So 
I stand yeah, alone a lot. I, you know, and we say this all the time, but everything we're going to be talking about today is obviously, you know, theories. There's some pretty solid evidence, but obviously right. nobody has a time machine. Nobody's right. jumping back there and like witnessing this themselves. It's just through evidence and theories, we can sort of make the assumption that some of this was the case. And of course, some of it might not be the case. And we'll, you know, maybe at some point historians and scientists will figure that out. I don't know. There's limits to what we can know, but this is the best information we have, I suppose, right now. Absolutely. Yeah. There's also, of course, a third sort of history that I almost wanted to include in this episode, but it was just going to become way too long. And that is the dinosaur history. Dinosaurs. <laughs> we we got to come back to that on another episode. Yeah. That's, I, as that's, I was pointing, I think people are interested in dinosaurs. I think a lot yeah. of people might be interested in dinosaurs. As I was pulling this episode together, I was like, ooh, this is really fun. This could be a really fun part of this episode. Talk about some of the dinosaur stuff that was going on. And then quickly, it was like becoming an episode about dinosaurs itself. And I was like, oh, this is becoming way too much and way too big for a single episode. So I was like, push it off to the side. Let's not tackle during this episode. We'll get to dinosaurs at some point and do them justice unto themselves. Okay, so with that, Let's go ahead and talk about sort of the geologic history of the landmass itself. That's sort of where we're going to start. This has to do, listener, with plate tectonics and how our, cons- our Earth is constantly moving. I think generally, if you know anything about sort of earthquakes or you know where earthquakes ha- hit, you know, California, Pacific Northwest, Alaska, Japan, Ring of Fire, you know, Chile, you're going to know something a little bit about plate tectonics. And that is they're always constantly moving a little bit and sort of colliding into each other and scraping up against against themselves that's generally what pangea did that's how it formed and that's how it sort of broke apart through this process and yes listener just so you know as you as we're as you're listening to this right now the plates are moving (laughs) just very slowly (laughs) it's a dynamic (laughs) earth yes yeah in fact there's some people some uh, geologists who theorize that at some point the the earth will create another another supercontinent it'll become another pangea like sort of thing that's, I don't know I, if, if that's, I trust that will take a while, right? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, none of us will be around for that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's way, way in the future, you know, hundreds of millions of years, probably. We got other Great. things. So, we got other things on our plate before that, that happens. Yeah. So we don't have to worry about we, the, the reforming of Pangea anytime soon. We do. So let's dive into the geologic history a little bit because it'll help set up sort of what Pangea is. And Hunter, I'm just going to throw this question at you. What is Pangea? Pangea is when all the, as we, as you described a little bit, is when all the continents that we know today were connected. And so there was a single landmass on the planet. Is that right? Exactly. It was a single landmass. It was, it's quote unquote, a supercontinent. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about, you know, maybe what a supercontinent is, because there's been some around and sort of different forms and doesn't always mean a single landmass, but Pangea is the single landmass that where every single, uh, landform that existed at the time was connected in some way. And so Pangea w- existed during the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic era. We're going to get to some years here in a, in a little bit, but those are sort of the the eras that they existed in. And despite it being commonly thought of as the original landmass of Earth, it actually wasn't. In fact, it assembled from earlier continental units called Gondwana, Euramerica, and Siberia during the Carboniferous period approximately 335 million years ago. See, this is news to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think people, I think people naturally assume, like they they probably heard of Pangea before and they probably naturally assumed, oh, that was, that was the original landmass of the planet. Right. But it's like, it's not, in fact, it's not even close, right? You can go back. I think we're going to get to, so I have some dates here really quick. Let me get through that. So, the Pangea sort of culminated into sort of the supercontinent we know today at the end of this period called the Permian period around 300 million years ago. It's a while. It's a while ago. Right. But if you go to that website that that we talked about earlier, dinosaur, what was it? Dinosaur uh, pictures.org slash ancient earth. You can go back 700 million years ago. So it's not even, we are closer to Pangea today than Pangea was to the first original landmass on the planet, which is wild to think about. It's a little mind boggling <laughs> to think about that kind of time span. Yeah. In fact, I, I didn't mention this in the beginning. We've gone back in time 
in this podcast quite a bit. You know, oftentimes we're, you know, we're playing around in sort of, you know, maybe the ancient era of hum- human history or, right. or, you know, oftentimes, you know, industrial era a few hundred years ago. I think once we went like a hundred million years ago. Yeah. I can't remember what episode that was. Yeah, I can't remember either. But yeah, this maybe is invasive species. this is going really far. We can't go too much further back than that. I mean, I guess we can because it does go back further. But yeah, this is probably a a new time machine record for us. The way back machine is set way back. It is. Yeah. We're, we're going way back. So uh, we might go back when we, when we do the dinosaur episode, there might be some, some, some things that we cover that even go you know farther back, but we're definitely hitting a record today. So Pangea started to form sort of around 335 million to 300 million years ago, 300 million years ago is when they sort of theorized that actually came together. And according to geologists, the continent then began to break apart around 200 million years ago at the end of the Triassic and beginning of the Jurassic period. Jurassic being of Jurassic Park fame, the movie. So 100 million years is the lifespan of Pangea roughly. Is that what we're talking about? Yep. Okay. Generally. And things are, again, things are moving. Things are still like shifting around. Right. Things are always in motion. So it's not like all of a sudden all the continents just broke apart. Right. Exactly. In, in fact, you know, there's like people can sort of get a, a real look at sort of how this this these plate tectonics and, and things are changing on our Earth today. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was off the coast of Japan just recently, and I don't have the, the news in front of me, but an island formed, a brand new island, right? There was a there was a volcanic eruption under the ocean and okay. it spewed things up and like it created a small little island. That's like that's the process that's happening constantly you know, for Pangea, for, for our earth right now. And that's how eventually things, you know, form new things and then eventually break apart and all this kind of stuff. So people can sort of see this process, you know, going, (laughs) getting back to Pangea. So in contrast to sort of the present earth and, you know, our current continental distribution, Pangea was C shaped. So it was a super, you know, continent. It was all cramped together, but it was, it was kind of in the shape of a C. So there's some the bulk of water in the middle and this kind of thing. It wasn't just, yeah, all there's some water in the middle. Agglomerated. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And there, that, that body of water sort of has a name to it. We might, I think we, I have that here in my notes here in a okay. minute, but the bulk of its mass stretched between earth's Northern and Southern polar regions and surrounded by the super ocean. It's called Panthalassa ocean. So that's sort of there was no separate oceans during that time because everything was sort of connected. And so that's Panthalassa. Right. So that's the Pacific Ocean plus all the other ones. That's a big ocean. Pacific Ocean. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe there was, you know, had we been around back then, I'm sure we would have tried to name things differently because <laughs> it's what humans like to do. But, you know, looking back hindsight, I guess they just, they figured one, one ocean name was enough. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about, well, actually, so... Pangea is the most recent supercontinent to have existed. So after sort of once Pangea started to break apart, that's sort of that's sort of the process to get to where the continents we are today. There are some arguments that we already we still have a supercontinent, and that would be well, I think that was probably pretty obvious. Hundred, what 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 continent might that be? Eurasia, exactly. Right. Yeah. That's. I mean, it's by far the biggest landmass that that exists on the planet. It's it's really quite large. So some argue that that is still, you know, our supercontinent. It's just, we don't really call it that. Um, Pangea is the most recent supercontinent to have existed and to the first to have been reconstructed by geologists. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk a little bit about how scientists discovered Pangea in a little bit, you know, maybe sort of maybe towards the end of the episode, we'll get to the sort of human history of how they all figured all this out. But now let's talk about how it uh, formed. We started talking about sort of the age that it started to form, all that kind of stuff. Let's talk more specifically, how did this thing come together? Because it's, again, it's a massive piece of land. It's very prominent. You know, how did, how did this all happen? And so Pangea, over the course of millions of years, combined all of Earth's land masses into a single vast continent. And prior to Pangea forming, there was another supercontinent that wasn't quite as large, but still had most of the land on the planet. This this supercontinent was called Gondwana. Okay. All told, scientists theorize that there have been 10 separate supercontinents that have come together and broken apart over the course of billions of years. And so, so we actually Pangea might be, we is might be. just the most recent, not real recent by human standards, but it's the most recent one we, we've got. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 
all told, it's not that old. It's kind of like a baby, hey. aside from the fact that it's broken up. <laughs> but, right? If you're if you're looking back at some of these, and there's a list floating around out there on one of the the geology sources I used. I can't remember the the website off the top of my head, but actually, it might be that dinosaurs website. Anyways, you can sort of see it's like this is what this landmass is called, and sort of you go back 700 million years, and you can sort of see what this one and this one and this one. It's very cool. It's it's kind of again, it's fascinating to like understand how we even know that this was a thing. How can we even theorize this? And of course, you know, as we're talking about all of this, you know, what even counts as a supercontinent is constantly up for debate. And we sort of talk about that Eurasia, you know, some people are like, well, that is a supercontinent. One of those supercontinents was, you know, during this time when Pangea was forming, one was called Gondwana. The other one was called Columbia because, which I kind of found funny because even, you know, Ancient, ancient, ancient right. history can't escape the Columbia name. <laughs> <laughs> That's very anachronistic, but yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it's, like, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> Getting back to Pangea. So the supercontinent would become mostly whole when Gondwana would crash into another large continent at the time called Euramerica. Mm. And so with, with these three, it's sort of all crashing together. Euramerica... Hunter, do you have an idea of where that might be? I'm guessing from context, Europe and, and, and the Americas, perhaps. Yeah, broadly. So, you know, if, if you're sort of keeping in, in, up with this sort of the naming device here, listener, it is a combination more specifically of North America and Europe, roughly. And so this is kind of, you know, the Appalachian Mountain Range and Scottish Highlands were, you know, they were all sort of part of the same thing. Eventually they get split apart and we'll sort of walk through that split and sort of the division because it was actually the, the reason why we have the Atlantic Ocean is because of an original division that sort of started to split the, mm-hmm. the continents in half. And so when the, the, these sort of continents sort of combined, I believe it was Colombia and, and your America com- combined originally, they created a new continent, new supercontinent called Laurasia. Gondwana, <laughs> just to keep things geographically representative to today, was common was primarily comprised of South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and a bit of Western and Southwest Asia. Okay. There's a there's a whole lot of sort of geographic positioning in this episode, but hopefully people are sort of understanding. We have the we have the, the Columbia Euro America continent up north. We have the which be Came, became Laurasia, Gondwana in the south, which was sort of South America, Africa. And you can kind of see this, right? If I think this is probably a pretty common refrain, but if you look at, you know, Africa and you sort of see South America, you can almost kind of squish them together and they almost kind of fit like a puzzle piece. Yeah, it, it, it adds up. I mean, yeah. it seems to be pieces that fit together. And right. you know, it's still stretching my, my geographic imagination a bit, <laughs> but yeah, I get that. Yeah. And so this, when these two continents, the ones, one in the north and one in the south, finally crashed in together, forming Pangaea, this would result in something called the Central Pangaean Mountain Range, hmm. which we have already talked about, Hunter, which was the combination of the A- Appalachians, you know, Atlas, Scottish Highlands. And the Central Pangaean Mountain Range was, at this point in time, the largest, tallest, most impressive mountain range on the planet. Um, it was probably, they theorize, at least as high as the Himalayan mountain range is today. Oh, wow. Okay. Obviously, so the, a lot of erosion since then. There's been, there's been a lot of erosion since then, as it turns out over a few hundred million years, because the Appalachian ma- mountain range certainly is less mountains and more impressive hills, I would say. <laughs> so... With that, the supercontinent was basically at its apex. This all kind of sounds very dramatic as these things are crashing into each other. You know, mountain ranges are forming, supercontinents, super oceans. But just, you know, it's worth pointing out for the listener that this is all happening over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. So it sounds dramatic, but it's probably if you were just standing there on Pangaea today, it's not like these epic things would be happening in front right. of you. I mean, there's geologic... The, the geologic timeline is it's 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 another scale. It's something. It's a celestial scale. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard to wrap your head around a little bit. Yeah, because I mean, dinosaurs were around. And not to bring up dinosaurs again, but they're around for a lot longer than we've been around, right? Isn't that the case? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've talked about how Pangaea is formed. Of course, once it formed, because plate tectonics being what they are, it almost immediately started to break apart, immediate being a relative term, of course. Right. 
<laughs> because that's how, you know, again, that's how plate tectonics work, right? It's, it, nothing's ever going to stay still. It's not like, you know, the earth formed and it's like, okay, we're done. That's good. Let's chill for a little bit. Um, so let's start talking a little bit about how it started to break apart. And we're going to do that right after we get to our first ad break. All right. Well, we'll be right back. And we're back. You're listening to the Geography is Everything podcast. Today, we're talking all about Pangea, the most recent supercontinent, probably most famous supercontinent that most people maybe have probably heard about, or if you're at all sort of within the geography or geologic sort of area, you probably absolutely have heard about it. We just went through how Pangea formed, so now let's start talking about how it broke apart. That's sort of, again, as, as sort of we left you during, right before the ad break, we sort of said... It started. It, it formed. It became sort of its apex, and it immediately started to drift apart. And that's like just a, how continents. An immediate, quick, a hundred million years later, it starts to drift apart. <laughs> exactly. In just a quick hundred million years. So, the breakup of Pangaea started in the early Jurassic period, theorized somewhere around 175 million years ago. Again, this is it's kind of like hard to like conceptualize these kinds of like you know this this amount of years, this, these these date ranges, all this kind of stuff. It's still a very long time ago. And this would eventually, as Pangaea broke apart, this would eventually lead to the continents we know today. And once again, go go back and visit that dinosaurpictures.org website. You can sort of see, you can actually, again, you can click different tabs and sort of see how the breakup you know, occurred and sort of, you know, what things looked like, you know, 20 years ago, 40 million years ago. Overall, the breakup occurred in roughly three large phases. The first phase would be the opening up of the Atlantic Ocean. We talked a little about this, Hunter, already. The initial rifting began in the north central Atlantic. And so, again, if you're watching on YouTube, there's going to be a map of Pangaea. You're going to start to see how, how some of this stuff uh, happens, but I'll try and walk you through it. So, sort of in that north area, there's sort of like a sea already. And as the plate tectonics sort of shift and things get pulled apart, the water is able to sort of get in there. It's causing more erosion. And eventually, the the Atlantic Ocean starts to form. And so the initial rifting began in north central Atlantic, proposed around sort of the late Ladinian era. It's 230 million years ago, approximately. The rifting proceeded along the eastern margin of North America, right? That'd be the east coast of the United States and okay. Canada today. I guess maybe Greenland's a little bit in there as well. Northwest African margin. So, right. So that's sort of where Morocco and, you know, all that, you know, I guess Africa region over there, and then the sort of the European sort of region as well, right? That's sort of where the rift, and you can start to see this happening, the, the, the actual sort of spreading out of the continents. A new phase of rifting started in the early Middle Jurassic period, this would be around the 175 million years ago, extending uh, from the Tethys Ocean to the Pacific, leading to the formation of the North Atlantic Ocean. And the Tethys Ocean is sort of, again, it's like, there's the big ocean, and then there's sort of like the sea, sort of in the middle, of the uh, and the sea shaped of the mm -hmm. of the Pangaea. That's sort of the Tethys Ocean. It's to the super ocean, but distinct Connected because to there the was a bunch ocean. of land around it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And then the South Atlantic opened up during the Cretaceous period as Laurasia rotated clockwise and moved northward, leading to the closure of the Tethys Ocean. Right, so that ocean sort of went away; it sort of closed off. And then this creates sort of the, the formation of the Arctic Ocean and new rifts around Africa, Antarctica, and Madagascar initiated the southwestern Indian Ocean formation. This is sort of hard to, again, this is hard to conceptualize because like things are moving around. But just know it sort of started in the north and you can sort of see the, the rifts start to break up over there. And that proceeded to, have to, to cause effects both within the Arctic as well as in sort of the southern continent, Gondwana sort of area and sort of break things apart down there. And that created the South Atlantic Ocean. Once this was done, Hunter, because, you know, this ocean is sort of causing a lot of, you know, divisions across across Pangaea, this would almost be immediately followed up by the breakup of Gondwana, right? Okay. So we talked about this already, but South America and Africa, they, they kind of fit, right? Yeah. I mean, look at a map, right? Look at a globe and you could sort, yeah. of, you can sort of see it. Exactly. It, it, it tucks right Again, in. Yeah, it's like it's it's kind of like funny because you you start to like think about these things. You're like, how did they ever conceive of this idea, 
that, that, that there was a supercon and that all these land masses were together. But it only really takes looking at, you know, the current continents from a certain angle and you're like, oh, oh, I do see how, you know, that could possibly fit there. <laughs> yeah, you stare at it for a while and it, it makes some sense, I think. I remember doing this exercise as a kid and not knowing about Pangea, not having been taught about that. And I was doing a project with a, another student and, you know, we, we came up with that idea, not knowing that, you know, this was a thing already, but we felt like, wow, we, we're onto something here. Uh, and then we learned <laughs> yeah. that, you know, yeah, this, this has been established and to which we said, well, why didn't you tell us that before? But anyways, <laughs> that's funny. So, Getting back to Gondwana, that's sort of, again, this is sort of, you know, I think I'd mentioned it's South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and sort of the Southwest Asia period or, or location. And so this would start to break apart beginning in around sort of the early Creta- Crustaceous period. So that's sort of around 150 million years ago, maybe 140 million years ago, Who who's counting though. And so the separation of Atlantica which is a continent that sort of forms, you know, out of this breakup. And that's largely South America and Africa, sort of Atlantica. From Eastern Gondwana, which is Antarctica, India, and Australia, occurred following the fragmentation of Gondwana in the Middle Crustaceous period. And this is sort of when the South Atlantic Ocean really starts to open up, right? And you again, you can sort of start to see this happening, or you can sort of see the after effects of this with South America and Africa literally being on two sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, right now, uh, South America and Africa are still together. But this sort of starts the period where the other continents, you know, India, I guess isn't a continent, you know, subcontinent. subcontinent but yeah. India, yeah, Antarctica and Australia start to break apart from they those start two. start to drift right? apart. Yep. Start to drift apart. Madagascar and insular India separated from Antarctica, moving northward and opening up the Indian Ocean. And this is, you know, this is, so this is starting to happen, you know, around a hundred million years ago. Uh, we're not really going to talk about India too much, but I think it's probably pretty common knowledge that India, it's called a subcontinent. Do you know why it's called a subcontinent? Because it sticks out from a continent? I don't know. What do you no, it's, it's, it's called a subcontinent because it's, it's on its own plate. And at one point, okay. so, so you have Asia, right? You have sort of, and we talked a little bit about sort of the, the landmass, you know, that, that sort of existed in sort of the northern hemisphere, and it's on its own plate. In India, it's absolutely connected to Asia today, but what? But it wasn't a part of it historically. It was part of sort of the Gondwana, this sort of southern area. And eventually, what would happen is is India will drift north and sort of slam into again. This is all sounding very dramatic. Slam into Asia and create the Himalayan mountain range. Okay, so that explains that. Yeah. So that, that explains that. And so it's sort of like, it really crashes in there, creates this, right. again, if, you, if you're watching this on like fast forward, you can, it, it'd be very dramatic, uh, but you can sort of see, you know, this, this sort of occur and sort of that it's sort of called the subcontinent because it's not, it's not really part, it's part of Asia, you know, geopolitically, you know, whatever you want to call it culturally even, but in terms of plate tectonics, it, it really is kind of its own subcontinent it's sort of. And at some point, it will probably drift drift away. It'll probably start moving back south or something, or further so towards Asia. Who knows? Yeah, or further, or yeah, it'll, or it'll Maybe keep crashing in and then, bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we know anything about this, isn't an episode about Mars, but if we know anything about Mars, we what, what we can say is that mountains can get a whole lot bigger than they are on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like Olympus Mons is like three times the size of Mount Everest or something like that. It's crazy. We'll come back. So, to getting Mars. back to you, yeah, yeah, we'll come back to Mars. Yeah, uh, did a future episode maybe. Man, that might get that might get a little beyond our our scope here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to Pangaea. So, uh, we're still inside of this 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 part this period of Gondwana breaking up. The only the last thing to say is that New Zealand because we never want to leave them out. New Caledonia and Zealandia. Have you ever heard of Zealandia, Hunter? I think I have, but I'm not really able to place it. Yeah, so Zealandia is it's actually the sunken continental crust that's under under New Zealand. Okay. So it's kind of interesting because if it had things gone differently, Zealand New Zealand would be almost an equal size sort of 
continental, you know, area as Australia. It's just all, it's a lot of, it's just sunken underwater. Okay. But at one point it was, it was surfaced, right? Because there was a lot more glaciers, things were still, you know, trapped in sort of the poles, what have you. And at this point in time, you know, Zealandia is sort of there. And so New Zealand, you know, modern day country, New Caledonia, modern day territory, I believe of France and Zealandia sunken underground sort of starts to drift away from Australia and towards the Pacific opening up the current, you know, seas, the Coral Sea and the Tasman Sea, and sort of that area in between New Zealand and Australia. I don't think a lot of New Zealanders would like to admit that they were once, at one point, connected to Australia, <laughs> but they were, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't well, change the yeah. geology. <laughs> we were all connected, apparently, at one point. We were all connected, yeah. <laughs> so one last thing before we sort of hit the, before we're done talking about the breakup of Pangaea, and that is, talking about the opening up of the Norwegian Sea in the north and the breakup of Australia and Antarctica in the south. So occurring in the early Cenozoic period, uh, as probably around 60 to 55 million years ago, as Laurasia was splitting with North America, Greenland separating from Eurasia, that sort of opened up the Norwegian Sea. And so that's sort of up there in the middle. That's sort of how Greenland and sort of North America sort of drifts off to the west and then Europe and Asia sort of no, they kind of stay inside the same area. Okay. Maybe start to drift a little bit to the east, but not not a whole whole lot, as far as I can tell. Meanwhile, at the same sort of the same time, Australia down in the south splits from Antarctica and starts to move northward and very far to the east. While India, we already talked about this, will head north and collide into the Eurasian continent. And that sort of, again, that, that creates the Himalayan mountain range and closes what it was called at the time, the Tethys Seaway. So that would have been in that sort of water body in between India subcontinent and Asia at the time. Again, this is happening over millions of years. So meanwhile, the African plate changed directions towards Europe and South America, as, as we know today, moved northward allowing for ocean circulation around Antarctica, leading to its glaciation. And so Africa and, and South America, still connected at the time, starts to break up, but they move northward. Antarctica starts to move, drift southward. And then comes basically the you know icy glacier we know today. And love. We love it too. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about Antarctica perhaps in particular right now. It sort of piques my, my interest because there was all kinds of stuff going on there that – you know, life. And I mean, there's life there now, but you know, you know, this was in a different part of the world. It wasn't in the Arctic or the Antarctic region. And so who knows what's under there? In other words, it is funny. So we're going to, we're going to end our our episode today talking about sort of where we're at today with like relative relation. If we existed back then in the same place, where would we have been? We're going to talk a little bit about this kind of stuff, but it's, it's really fun thinking about this as a thought process, because I think to your point, Hunter, that, Antarctica back in Pangaea, it was still pretty far south, so it was still pretty cold, likely. But it wasn't it wasn't where it's at today. It wasn't directly on the South Pole. And therefore, it probably had flora and fauna, it probably had animals and you know plants and everything living on it. And so it, it's interesting thinking about like what's what's different and how it might have how things might have been different had, let's say, Antarctica instead of floating south into South America, maybe floated north with with you know South America and Africa and maybe even situated itself in between those two and sort of became its own landmass. I mean, I think it's probably safe to say that it would have been colonized. <laughs> right. That's for sure. And probably called America. And then <laughs> and then whoever yeah, left from there would conquer, you know, the North and South America and call it after whoever did that. <laughs> They probably I'm not blaming America. America Vespucci for conquering, you know, the, the Americas because that he had kind of not a whole lot to do with that. Absolutely, it is worth highlighting at this point in time, Hunter. That all of this that's happening, you know, this breaking up of sort of continents and everything, uh, did cause a huge change in the climate due to CO two emissions being released. Obviously, there's lots mm -hmm. of stuff happening, and it's going to cause a lot of carbon to, to to go up into the atmosphere. And so the breakup was marked by significant CO2 gases from the continental rifts contributing to a warm early crustaceous period climate. And this is sort of a lot of the, the glaciers at that time start to melt. And that's when things like Zealandia get sunk underneath the ocean. I'm not sure how that relates to some of the more modern uh, ice ages and, you know, whether Zealandia resurfaces, or, resurfaces during that time is sort of, again, outside of, outside of this episode's uh, realm. 
All right, so that's the that's the geologic history part of the 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 episode. We're gonna now jump into some of the human history and do some of those fun location comparisons. Uh, We're gonna talk about to help. the people. Yeah, how we how we know yeah, what we about, know. How do we know what we know? But first, before we get to that, we gotta hit our last ad break. So let's go ahead and do that, and we will be right back. And we're back. You're listening to the Geography is Everything podcast. Today, we're talking about Geography is Pangea, the last supercontinent, but not certainly not the, the, the first or the original, as we've already discussed. So, Hunter, let's go talk about a little bit of the human history. How do we know that even all of this was a thing? It's kind of kind of hard to fathom. That's what I've been wondering, other than looking at a map or a globe and saying, yeah, these may be, these fit together. There's, there's probably a little bit more to it than that, I'm guessing. There's there's a little bit more to it. I think, again, you know, we've already mentioned this. This These are all just theories, and that's okay. And like, obviously, we're barring us inventing a time machine and going and looking at this, that's all we can sort of go by. So let's talk about sur- first sort of the origin of the Pangaea name. So it's derived from ancient Greek pan, meaning in all, entire, or whole, and Gaia or Gaia, meaning Mother Earth land, right? So it's sort of the combination of those two words. That's how we get the Pangaea. I guess Gaia and Gia, maybe instead of Gaia, I don't know. The original concept of Pangaea was proposed by a scientist named Alfred Wegener. He's a G- German scientist. And he proposed the con- concept of a continuous, contiguous landmass, supporting it with evidence in his 1912 publication, The Origin of Continents, and expanded it in his t- 1915 book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans, introducing the idea of the supercontinent, which he named the Urk continent. And that's a sounds German to me, but I don't know exactly what that might so mean. This was a little over 100 years ago, which in geologic time was... Like five seconds ago. <laughs> In geologic time, it's probably like a millisecond ago. Right, right. <laughs> so um, it, we can say recently. Right. <laughs> yeah, we can say, in this case, we can say 100 years ago, pretty recent. Wegener would then go on and use Pangea in his 1920 edition of his book, referring to it as the Pan- Pangea of the Carboniferous, which is sort of the era at the time. And later, the name was adopted in scientific literature in German and English post-1922 and 1926, respectively. And so from around the 1920s on, that's sort of when this this concept really comes into form with the idea that this is a Pangea. This and is the, the, the name. The term for it. stuck, it seems like. Right. Yeah. Initially, Wegener suggested centripetal forces due to Earth's rotation caused was as the cause for Pangaea's breakup, right? So like the Earth is spinning around, that's sort of what is causing things to spread out because, you know, listener, if you have like a, I don't know, a yo-yo or something on a string and you start spinning it around, it's going to pull itself like, you know, to the sides. That is a theory that Wegener had originally. It is a theory that was later deemed physically implausible, Scientists hesitate to ever say the word impossible, so right. they're just going to say it's implausible. <laughs> probably not um, is what they're saying. Probably probably not, yeah. Arthur Holmes proposed mantle convection, it's another scientist, as a more plausible mechanism, which, along with post-World War II ocean floor mapping, led to the acceptance of plate tectonics theories explaining the existence and breakup of Pangaea. This is also sort of that foundational research by Arthur Holmes that sort of leads to really an entire profession, which is seismology, right? As they're starting to understand what plate tectonics were and sort of that there are plates even, that sort of helps us identify, oh, where are earthquakes happening? Why are they happening? And sort of how can we better prepare for them or better prepare prepare places for them? So most people throughout most of human history weren't thinking about plates. They weren't thinking about plate tectonics. This is uh, 20th century stuff. Yeah. The 1900s, I mean, the time of discovery. <laughs> it, it would actually be kind of like interesting. And, I, and there, maybe there's a future episode where we talk about earthquake, earthquakes broadly. We, we, we do have an episode where we talked about um, the Cascadia earthquake and sort of what, you know, what it, could what it could do to the Pacific Northwest, but it might be interesting at one point to sort of talk about earthquakes broadly and sort of even the history, the human history of earthquakes, because I have to imagine that prior to sort of the knowledge we have today, 
earthquakes must have been steeped in sort of religious, you know, superstitions and, you know, these things like, oh, we angered, you know, yeah, what the did river we do god. Wrong? You had the, the earth is moving. Obviously, we've messed up somehow. Let's not let that happen again. You know, yeah. Exactly. You could, you could only possibly assume at, you know, given limited knowledge that that's some sort of deity or god, like you've really angered them. Was probably <laughs> upset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's move back, move back to Pangea. So, uh, so while Wegener theorized this as a concept, you know, this idea of Pangea, um, through the, the last few decades, there is a lot of evidence out there that has come together to support this idea that, that Wegener originally proposed. So some of the initial observations that, that sort of scientists have used, which is really just the close fitting of coastlines of North America and South America with Europe and Africa, suggest that Pangea existed, right? It's Again, we've talked about this. They kind of fit together. You can start to see, okay, this makes sense, you know, how things come together. That's kind of rudimentary. There was an early hypothesis by Abraham Ortelius in 1596. He may have actually been the very first person to propose that continents were once joined and later separated. Again, looking at some of these things, you know, as again, using early maps, how things might have been connected. Um, but getting to like more modern era sort of and more careful sort of reconstructions, scientists have actually been able to do what they call coastline match matching, which these are, again, these are careful reconstructions that showed less than 130 kilometer mismatch at the 500 fathoms contour, which is sort of fathoms is the depth of the ocean. And this sort of argues that, that these, these coastlines were once together, right? That things might have actually, even more so than sort of the land part of it, that things might have actually been really close to each other because so you're able to do the these. the continental shelf kind of situation. Exactly. It gives us even yep. more evidence that, hey, things were connected uh, because that's usually, I mean, there are maps who show the continental shelf, but many of the maps, many of the globes we look at, they don't show that. But uh, if you were to look at that, apparently this fits even right. more. Yeah. It is funny because we're we're we're, we're land based species, so everything that we sort of perceive and you know conceptualize, we, we tend to conceptualize it at the sea level and above, right? Rocker. And it's it's interesting because so much of our planet is not above that <laughs> level. The the vast majority of our planet is below that level, and so doing something like this, you know, where they're where they're actually matching this up underwater, you know, five hundred fathoms below. Um, they're actually able to get more accurate readings than sort of what the coastline is that we know today, which makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about it from that angle. I think you mentioned on another episode that and we've been to the moon, but there's a lot of places in the ocean that we don't really know much about. So it's interesting that you know, we've left the planet to check something out, but there's still a lot about the depths of the ocean that is fairly unknown to people. Yeah, we... we have better maps and charts of both the moon and Mars than we do of our own ocean. That's something. Yeah, that's amazing. That's something. That's that's interesting, right? Carrying on, there's geologic evi evidence to suggest that the South America and the east coast of South America and west coast of Africa were together, right? So there's, there's similar geologic formations and rocks and everything like that. There's also glacial evidence that suggests that there are identical glacial deposits across now separated continents wow. indicate that they were once united by Pangaea and so on and so forth, right? We can, we can go down, there's fossil evidence, there's the mountain chains continuity that we talked about, the central Pangaean mountains, right? They can sort of compare that kind of stuff. There's magnetic orientation of rocks. There's a lot of evidence at this point that suggests that actually we, maybe we don't know exactly what Pangaea looked like. Maybe we don't know you know, specific things, but it, there seems to be a, an overwhelming amount of evidence that says, yeah, this was real. This was here. These continents were connected at some point and yeah, I guess Pangaea existed. So, so it's kind of amazing. So these, these representations we see on the website that you referenced and other places, they're, they're people's best guess of what this might've looked like. Exactly. It's right. It's, it's so hard to you know, again, you know, going back 200, 300 million years ago, do we know exactly that the, you know, a certain landmass curved around in a certain specific way? Probably not. Like, yeah. I, I just, I don't know if we can be that, that fine detailed about it. I mean, it. I but can't what, always I remember we, what happened last month, you know, so it makes sense that, you know, if we weren't even around, we might not have figured it out. So. Exactly. So, all right. 
let's leave behind the human history. That's sort of how we sort of know sort of it came together. But let's let's sort of conclude today's episode and talk about where we are located within Pangea today. So the idea being, I thought this would be fun for listeners, okay. that if Pangea were still a continent today, and you, me, and listener, you were still located where you're at today, where would you be relative to that Pangea location? And so, Hunter, we're here in Portland, Oregon. Right. Sort of cold, dreary Pacific Northwest. Yesterday, Valentine's Day was particularly cold and dreary. <laughs> do you have <laughs> do you have any idea where we would be on the Pangaea continent relative to the planet? I'm not I'm, I'm just going to have to use my imagination here and imagine we'd still be on the West Coast. We would still kind of be on the West Coast. Apparently, the Pacific Northwest, you know, of the United States in Pangaea was located somewhere in or around what would be the Gulf of Mexico today. So wow. we would be okay. quite a bit farther right. south. Yep. And we would be, and we'd be, you know, the Pacific Northwest would probably no longer be cold and dreary. Instead, it would probably be pretty warm and sunny. <laughs> a lot of beachfront action. Yeah. A lot of beachfront. They would probably, you know, the Oregon coast, which is, again, a, a beautiful coast, probably get a lot more surfing action and hey, sunbathing right. action yeah, than it yeah. does today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's spin the globe a little bit and talk a little bit about New York City. So now that you kind of know where okay. the Pacific Northwest is, Hunter, do you have any idea where New York City might be? I'm thinking North Atlantic, maybe a little closer to where Europe is now. Yeah, kind of. So New York City today would look very different if it existed, right? So I think the first thing to, to note here is that New York City would not be a coastal city, right? Because Pangaea and, and the North American continent and Euro Europe continent were smashed together. So there's no Manhattan right. Island at this point. <laughs> there's no Manhattan Island at this point. Maybe it's maybe there's a river or something. I don't yeah. know. Instead of being a coastal city, it would exist in the middle almost smack dab in the middle of the central Pangean mountain range. Again, a mountain range that it was at least it's theorized to at least be as tall as the Himalayans are today. So you have to sort of start to think that New York city, if it existed, would be almost like a Kathmandu, Nepal kind of city. It's like, it's up there in the mountains. In the mountains. Yeah. It's in the mountains. And I think you're generally right in that it gets sort of pushed to the, um, I guess sort of the central sort of Atlantic region. I don't think it's, I, I think it might be at the, a very similar latitude though. Interestingly, I'd have to go back and look at the map. So I don't have that. Right notes. around where the Titanic sunk, maybe something like that. <laughs> oh, probably. Yeah. So it might actually have a, a pretty similar climate aside from the fact that it's very continental and very high altitude. Right. Yep. So I guess maybe a very not similar climate now that <laughs> so I say a that a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, the central Pangean mountain range, that's the one that's the Appalachian Mountains, Atlas Mountains, and Scottish Highlands. They all got crammed together. How about Buenos Aires? Um, all right, based on what we're talking about, it's would still be in what we consider to be the Southern Hemisphere, I'm guessing. Um, but, but in the Atlantic, where the Atlantic is now. Yeah, kind of, right? So going back to Pangaea, so Buenos Aires is, if, listener, if you're unfamiliar, that's on the east coast, kind of, sort of instead of a little inlet there, but broadly east coast of, of South America, mm -hmm. sort of in the central, maybe a little bit of a southern half of South America, Yeah, but sort of in sort of the middle part. Or southern, probably, um, yeah. Yeah, and so what we know is that, that when South America was originally connected to Africa, so again, this is a, a case of a coastal city today that would not be a coastal city in, in the, in, during Pangaea. We also know that South America broke free from Africa and drifted far more than Africa ever drifted. I mean, Africa sort of drifted a little bit and moved a little bit north, but it's generally still in the same place. And so Buenos Aires back then would probably be much farther east. It would be connected to Africa and sort of be sort of maybe like a central plains kind of wow, yeah, uh, city. Very different, right? It would probably be, and it's and it's a little bit farther south too, so it would be a little bit colder as well. Very fun. What about Australia? Okay, so Australia then would be. You hint earlier. I mean, it's 
where the Indian Ocean would be now, closer to Madagascar. Kind of, yeah. That's what I'm going with. So this was where, this one's really fun because I think Australia is perhaps the most dramatic sort of difference. Okay. I mean, there have been some pretty dramatic differences, but Australia back in Pangaea was, so if you have sort of the, let's imagine South America and Africa sort of cobbled together. Okay. And then extending off the southern end of sort of the, I guess, you know, South Africa, Madagascar area was Antarctica crammed up against it. Okay. So I'm still very far south. And if you keep heading east and you sort of see, you know, Australia sort of has that sort of on the bottom, that sort of like circular sort of formation. Okay. So if you turn Australia, you know, sort of 90 degrees and you sort of cram it up against Australia down there, it sort of became, it was sort of an extension of, of or it's not a, of, of Antarctica, you sort of cram it up against Antarctica. Australia was sort of a, a continuation of Antarctica at the time. Wow. Okay. And so it broke off and spun a little bit and then floated it over to where off, it is now. Okay. Spun and floated northeast, right? Oh, because so it at got that further point, north. Okay. Yeah. It got further north, right? Because I mean, Antarct- Antarctica wasn't wasn't sort of on the South Pole during the time, but it was still probably really cold. It was still pretty far south. Right. And Australia. Likewise, was probably at the time very cold, mm. and so it's sort of a tale of two different stories. Antarctica, you know, they they started off very similar to each other. Antarctica broke apart, drifted south, became, you know, icy and and much more inhospitable. Uh, Australia, meanwhile, broke apart, moved northeast, and became much more livable and habitable. Right, and, and not to mention deserty, also <laughs> very deserty. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, let's just do one more. Let's do Greenland. Okay. So we did an entire. We, t- we had an entire episode all about Greenland. It was a very fun episode. Go check it out. The Greenland of Pangaea would be, dare I say, actually green. We be where? Say it again. It, w- it would be actually green. It would not be. Right, so right. We, we, exactly. Right. It would be <laughs> aptly you know, named. I mean, yeah. If you go back yeah. far enough in time, it makes sense. Yeah. Because so just thinking about sort of where it is today and sort of what we know that, you know, North America and, and Europe were sort of combined in a single thing. And they were they were all a little bit farther south. Greenland would have been right in between them, right? Squished right in between them. And therefore, it would have been warmer. It would have been continental. It would have probably been much more habitable. So, all right. That's all I have to say about Pangaea today because, well, we're kind of running out of time here. Well, that was, Hunter, that was a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I learned, I learned a bunch of things today. Okay, I'm glad. Hopefully, listener, you did too. Hunter, do you want to run through your pluggables? Sure, Jeff. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I am co-author of Portland is a Cultural Atlas in Upper Left Cities, a uh, cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. And I am, of course, co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. My name is Jeff Gibson. I'm also co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything. If you want to find more of my geography stuff online, go visit youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff, where I create videos there. You can also find us over on Substack. That's geography is everything dot substack.com. This podcast lives over there. It's an easy way to sort of get it served to you once a week. If you liked what you heard today, please, if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. It really helps us out there. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave a review. We always really appreciate seeing those. They really... I don't know if they help, but it's always nice to see anyways. I think, Hunter, next week we are doing, I think it's air travel. Are we doing air travel? That's correct. I think that's what's on tap. So not so much, I mean, part of that will be the history of the airplane, but it's more focused on the history of people using airplanes to get from place to place. I mean, it's it's how common that's gotten for many people. What's that? Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a transformational technology, right? It's For sure. it's something it's yeah. enabled humans to do things that we never would have been able to do had somebody not figured that out. I mean, you can get you know you can get from here to let's say someplace pretty far from here. Let's say New Zealand, right? Which isn't real close, and it, and it, and we you know it takes a long time, right? In in the sense that it takes like a day or a day and a half. Yeah. But, you know, before the airplane, it would have taken a lot longer. And yeah, so we're going to talk about how air travel has transformed people. Yeah, no, it should be a really fun episode. I think it'll probably wrap into one of my favorite geographic concepts, which is the time, time, space, compression theory. Oh, we'll talk Um, about that. 
we got to talk, talk about it. That. So come back next week. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Come back next week and learn all about air travel. And I guess with that, we will, well, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>